Good morning, Heart of God. I do want to remind you that uh, May 17th will be our first day back in the church. Naturally, there'll be some uh, uh, rules that go along with that, uh, but you'll know what they are. We'll post them and we'll hand you a piece of paper when you come in about keeping some social distance and stuff, but it'd be great to see everybody. And, and uh, I want you to remember that the the breakfast cafe will not be open on the on May 17th, and we won't have children's church on May 17th. But I want to tell you, uh, we're, it's still going to be great to see everybody. I'm very excited about it. And it won't be long and we'll be right back to having the breakfast cafe in children's church because we know how important that is. Um, I want to tell you once again that, that Debbie and I love you and we miss you and we can't wait to see you. And uh, I know it's not as good a thing to watch this on the internet as to see us in in person and let us see you in, in person and love on each other. Uh, I do want to remind you that Silas Arnold is also doing the broadcast on Thursday nights and he does, uh, I don't know if it's every other day, but he also does uh, uh, video blogs that you can, and he, he, he's a good teacher and I know you'll enjoy that. And then uh, Heinz Maurer, he's coming on at nine o'clock on uh, Sunday mornings and bringing a message. So. There's plenty of good teaching coming out from the church, and, uh, and we're so glad that you're part of what's going on. Now, this morning, last week I talked about love and compassion, but I'm going to get right back into our faith teachings this morning. So if you got your Bibles, you'll want to turn to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And we call that the Hall of Faith, or the, or the faith chapter. And uh, naturally, it's one of my favorite ones. I'll be speaking... Uh, it, it's true that when I got saved, the, the Bible that I memorized was in King James. Uh, but I'm going to be uh, uh, also teaching out of Hebrews 11 in the uh, Amplified Version is what I'm going to start off with. We're only going to ha uh, handle the first six verses in Hebrews 11. and uh, uh, but, but they're filled with a lot of good things. So we'll start out with Hebrews 11.1. 1. In the Amplified Bible, it said, Now faith is the assurance. I'm going to do a study one time, uh, sometime and find out how many times people said now before a sentence in the Bible because uh, I don't remember it a whole lot of times, but maybe there's more time. But uh, uh, that's why I'm, I'm thinking maybe when it says now faith, it means faith that you'll be operating in right now. Uh, because I don't think it was just a slam turn. Now let's uh, do this. No, I don't think that was it at all. I think he says the now faith, the faith that will operate and, and accomplish what it's supposed to. It says now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for. Being the proof of things we do not see, and the conviction of the reality, faith perceiving as real fact what is not re revealed to the senses. Now, that's, there's a lot of word in that because there are sometimes people say, I'm really believing for this. You know, the type of faith we're talking about here, uh, the Bible is very clear that he's given to everybody the measure of faith. Now, having been given the measure of faith, that was enough faith for you to get saved and to receive everything else that God has. But faith basically means believing God. But God has two ways in which may, people may come to him. The first is that you can come to him by works. Yes, if you can present your perfection in your works, God will accept you. But so far, nobody's been able to make it. Not by works. Adam didn't make it. Adam had a very simple job. Believe God. Enjoy what's inside the garden. Just don't eat of that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Isn't it amazing that you can have all that paradise and God gave him one commandment, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the problem with that is that there was nothing wrong with the commandment. But every time it seems that we're told we cannot do something, we really desire to do it. 
And so uh, uh, that was Adam's problem. The problem wasn't with God, but it was with Adam. And it's the problem that we have today. So the, the truth about it is, if you could present yourself perfect to God, then uh, he would accept you. But nobody's been able to do it. From Adam on, everybody has sinned. Uh, as a matter of fact, it tells us that in, uh, in Romans, the fifth chapter, that Adam sinned and that sin reigned from Adam up to, uh, up to Christ. And when the first Adam sinned, uh, because of that sin, people not only sinned, but they died. So the reality of it is it wasn't until Jesus overcame all that and we accept that by faith. Everything that we get from God, we receive by faith. You really can't come to God and say, listen, I, that's, that's the problem with people praying. You know what, God? I have paid my tithe and I have behaved well. I'm doing everything my wife tells me to do. And yet... I haven't received what I want. Well, listen, you can't come to God and tell him that you are good enough for him to give you good stuff. Even Jesus himself said uh, that, that uh, he said, why do you call me good? Isn't that amazing? And in the third chapter of the book of Romans, he said, there's none good, no, not one. Amazing thing. You can't come to God in your own goodness and your own perfection. You have to come by faith. But none of those that tried to come by works ever made it. And they never will. Therefore, it's not a satisfactory way to come to God. But many people are hobbling along in that futile way of trying to come to God. They believe because they've kept, kept all the commandments they can. But I, re I remember when the rich young ruler came to Christ, and Christ named a few commandments, not all of them. And that yet rich young ruler said, uh, well, these I've kept since my youth. But he made an interesting statement. One of the versions of the Bible, it says, he said, what yet do I still lack? Because at the end of commandment, you still lack. You have to receive Christ. You've got to believe God all the way. Dr. A.T. Robertson, uh, and it's used inside of this, uh, of the Amplified Bible, he translates the word substance as title deed. Your faith is the title deed. And, and what is that title deed? And what is that substance? It has to be based on something. When somebody handed you a deed to a property, uh, it's on a piece of paper and you know that it's there. And you can feel it and you can look at it and you can read it and it means that you own it. When you stand in faith, that means the thing you hope for is yours. You own it, it's yours. Now, if I really believe that, will I come begging God all the time for the same thing I asked him for? No. I, I stand upon the word, and I quote the word, and that's the important thing. Uh, it's the word of God. If your faith doesn't rest upon the word of God, then that means your faith is, faith is resting upon what you can do for God. It won't work that way. Every good and wonderful gift comes down from our Father God, uh, and there's no turning. I mean, God, what God says, that's the reason in 2 Timothy 2, 13, he said, when we are faithless, he is faithful. Well, what does that mean? That we shouldn't have faith? No. It means as we do the very best we can, we're going to fail. And God can't always count on us. But I want to tell you something. When we're faithless, he is faithful. He'll always keep his part of the bargain. Amen. And it says it's the evidence of things not seen in that scripture. We've seen that faith is the substance of things hoped for. That is, that's pretty scientific, really. It means it's something you can really hold on to. The second word here is, is the word evidence. It's a Greek word that means elikas. And it's a legal term for meaning evidence that is accepted for conviction. It means literally you can count on it. You can count on what God says. When we come to God in faith, we're not just flipping around in the air somehow. We're, we're, not, we're not like feathers blowing across a pond. That's not it at all. Our faith is based on fact. Because God's word, according to his own word, is already settled in heaven. 
And it is fact. And you can count on it. Now, for those people, you guys going through things, uh, uh, suffering of any kind, I want to tell you that I have a lot of compassion for you, and God has a lot of compassion. But if all you do is talk about your troubles, then you're not focusing upon the Word of God. Always apply the Word of God to your circumstances. Now, I've had people come up to me over the years and say, well, I know what the Bible says, but I've been going through this. I've been going through I said, listen to me. Don't judge the Word by your circumstance. Judge your circumstance by the Word of God. Then it goes on in the second verse and said, For by it, by what? Faith. By it, the elders obtained a good report. Well, who are the elders? Well, the elders are re referred to in the Old Testament were the fathers, the most important people of the time. And they're referred to in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, the same elders, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers. Who are the fathers? The fathers of the old, elders of the Old Testament. This verse could have been rendered like it. It said, uh, by such faith as this, the fathers received witness. Old Testament elders believed God. They believed God. You know, you can go through the, the Old Testament and you see all those stories about people that accomplished tremendous things. And uh, uh, why did they accomplish those things? Because led by the Spirit of God, they believed God. Now, sometimes people say, if I could really see God telling me to do something, and many times I've told them, if you saw a big hand go up in the wall of your house that wrote down instructions to you, and you'd say, well, I know that's God. Well, the Bible is, is, is written uh, by men, but it is the hand of God. It is inspired by God himself. What you find in the word of God, you can trust them. You can believe it. Their faith in the Old Testament rested upon evidence. Not evidence that they could see, but the evidence was the very promises of God that they had. Noah built an ark. And he did it by faith because he didn't know what rain was. Uh, he, the, you know, the, there was a mist that covered the ground, but there, there wasn't the same thing that we have now. So he did it by faith. Well, what kind of faith? Was it such a dream he had? It wasn't that wishy-washy thing where you say, oh man... I really believe it. I know it's going to happen for me someday. Let me tell you something. Base what you believe upon the Word of God, not some notion that you got. You know, I see it in Facebook all the time where people will say, I had a dream, I had a vision. I've had dreams and visions too. But did you know I don't live my life by dreams and visions? I live my life by the Word of God. Amen. That's the key. When it came to Noah, did he build that ark? Just because he had a notion, I'd like to, I believe this all going to change someday, so I'm going to build the biggest boat that's ever been. No. He had faith. God gave an abundance of evidence because Noah walked with God for many years. Now, in Hebrews 11, 3, through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. As a matter of fact, when it said the worlds were framed, that, ever, uh, that really meant the ages were formed. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. In the creation story, when we find that God spoke and things came into being. Why? Were they made of something? No. They weren't made of anything because nothing existed before God spoke it. And I love that. And the worlds were framed by the word of God so things were not, uh, seen were not made of things but do appear. There are two expl explanations for the origin of the universe. One is speculation and the other is revelation. By faith, we accept revelation. By faith, you'll also accept speculation. You'll believe maybe you used to be a salamander and climbed out of a mud pond 
and became a human being. Well, that would be speculation. But our belief comes out of revelation that God's given us. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. In other words, the ages were set up by the word of God. Everything that we see was made by him. It's quick. I think that's Hebrews 4.12 says that the, the word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God is more powerful than an atom or hydrogen bomb. Someone said that atom bombs come in three sizes, big, bigger, and where is everybody? <laughs> well, the word of God is even more potent than that. Because the word of God has the power to transform a life. I am one of those lives that was transformed. So are you. You were transformed not by your own ability, but you were transformed by the word of God, by the power of God working on your life. When you and I come to the word of God, we either accept or reject God's statement concerning the origin of the universe. When we come to the word of God, we either believe in the beginning God created the heaven and earth, or we don't believe that. But if you don't believe God created the heaven and earth, how are you going to believe anything else God said? Now, this isn't news to you. Because if you, try to, if you deal with somebody in business, you find them lying to you, it becomes hard to believe anything they say. The reality of it is, I believe everything. I had a Man tell me years ago, he said, well, book, book's just written by men and, and there's a lot of stories. They're not even true. I, I can't believe it. So let me tell you what I believe. I believe everything from where it says published by to the maps in the back. I believe everything in the word of God. Now we're going to go to Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice then Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Now we're looking back to the book of Genesis again and the story of these two boys, Cain and Abel. I want us to see just uh, what it was that Abel had and Cain didn't have. What was the difference between these two boys? In Genesis 4, 1, it said, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord, which literally meant I've gotten the man from the Lord. What man is she talking about? God had made it clear to Eve that there would be coming one in her line, the seed of the woman. But is that the seed of the woman that God was talking about? No. Christ was. Christ was the one that defeats Satan. But speaking to Satan, God said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. But Adam and Eve didn't know that the struggle with sin was going to last that long. Rarely do we understand that sin affects that way. They thought their first son would be the man who was going to come to defeat Satan. But Cain was not the Savior. He was a murderer. Genesis 4, 2, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. You ought to stop here and make a comparison between the boys because they were actually had a lot in common, although they were brothers, the sons of Adam and Eve. They were more alike than twins today could possibly be. Today, you can have two boys, and the first might be fine, upstanding boy. He goes through school, makes straight A's, goes to college, then becomes a professional man, perhaps a, a doctor. But the other boy doesn't do well in school at all, and he drops out. You know, uh, Sly and the Family Stone, I think, did this song where they go, and they go with this, uh, one boy grows up to be Somebody who just loves to learn and the other child grows up to be somebody who just loves to burn. Man, I, two children growing up today can be as 
far different as you could imagine. So one does everything they should do, and the other one gets out, drops out of school, begins to drink, smoke marijuana, get in trouble. What's the explanation? You can't use the explanation of heredity for the difference in these two boys. I think they, they were as like as two peas in a pod. I want to tell you that right now. There are people today say, well, a kid grows up good or grows up bad according to the environment. Well, I think it's more, more than that because here's Cain and Abel and they looked alike and acted alike many ways, but they were very different. You can't use the explanation of environment because they grew up in the same environment. A great many people today think that environment is what makes a real difference between men. They say that if we could just make the environment all right, every person would be all right. If we could just get rid of the slums and put people in nice homes, if people, if people just had money, they could take... None of those things are true. That's not what makes a difference. I had somebody come up to, one, to me one time and said, uh, you know, if you, if you give kids everything they want, they'll be spoiled. No. Kids will be spoiled if you don't teach them right. Some people get everything they want in life, are taught right, and they live great lives. And other were kids that weren't, that didn't have a great life, uh, taught right, and they have a great life. It's not about the environment. It's what you teach them. But, Ad, but Cain and Abel had the same environment. I can't think of a home that was much the same for their boys as the home of Cain and Abel. Genesis 4, 3 it goes on to say, And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground and offering to the Lord. In the process of time. It means at the end of days. I think it was the Sabbath day, and it was time for sacrifice. They came at a specific time. And that Cain brought, the word brought it is in the thought that it was brought to an appointed place. And Abel, he also brought the first things of the flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. What was the difference between the two offerings? What was the difference? Because you get these questions a lot. Didn't both come in obedience to God? No, they did not. You see, God had revealed to them they, that they were to bring a sacrifice, a lamb. And that little lamb pointed to Christ. Some people argue that Genesis does not say that. No, it doesn't say that. But Hebrews 11 does say it. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Well, how could he? Well, he came by faith. What is faith? Let's look at it again. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's one of the proofs that Cain and Abel had both heard the word of God. But one brought his sacrifice in faith and brought the type, right type. Abel had a revelation from God, but so did Cain. They were both in the same family. But Cain ignored it and he brought what he wanted to bring, the fruit of the ground. That which he had produced. In other words, here's the first man who brought his works unto God. Oh, look what I've grown, Lord. I've taken care of this. I'm in the abundance of ground. I'm bringing my very best to you. And I know God's attitude, well, it's not about you. It's not about you trying to impress me with what you've done. I already gave you instructions that it had to be a picture of Christ, so it had to be the blood of the Lamb. First man brought his works to God. A lot of people are still coming to God the same way. They come by works. They've done this and they've done that. I want to take this time to say right now that faith isn't about it isn't about you. It's coming to God with the word of God under the obedience of God in the way that he said to come to him. That's what faith is. It means you believe God. Why do you think the Bible says that whatever isn't of faith is a sin? Whatever isn't of faith is a sin. Cain brought that which he'd raised, but Abel brought a lamb and slew it. If you'd been there, you might have asked, Brother Abel, why are you bringing a lamb? And he would have said, well, God commanded it. Do you think the little lamb takes away your sin? Well, of course not. 
I just told you that God commanded us to bring it. He said to my mother there, that there's one coming in her line that was going to be a savior. And that person is the one to whom this little lamb points. I'm coming by faith, looking to the time when a deliverer and a savior will come. There at the very beginning, God made clear the way to himself. Without the shedding of blood, the Bible says there can be no remission of sin. We come to God on the one basis that we are sinners, that the penalty for our sins must be paid. That's the reason blood had to be shed. That's the reason a little lamb had to be slain. And you couldn't, you couldn't have a picture of Christ with a turnip or, or a stalk of corn. That wouldn't have been a picture of Christ. That little old lamb couldn't, uh, couldn't take away sin, but it showed the picture of Christ, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It was offered in faith. Abel's offering pointed to Christ. God made the way very clear in the beginning. Today, though a man be a stranger uh, and a fool, he doesn't need to make that same mistake. He can trust in Christ. Christ is the way to himself. God gave him, uh, uh, him to die for our sins. Jesus, the perfect lamb without blemish, paid with his own blood to wash us of sin. Therefore, illustrates us to the way of faith. It is the blood-sprinkled way, the way that's Christ. And then we come to Enoch. In Hebrews 11:5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And Genesis 5 is where we find Enoch mentioned for the first time. And it's a very sad chapter. This is the book of the generations of Adam and the way that God created man in the likeness of God made he him in Genesis 5.1. We're told that Adam lived 130 years and begat a son, Seth. Then Adam died, and Seth lived and begat a son. Then Seth died. In Adam, all die. All die. That's the way it's been going on for a long time. We'll continue the way. The fifth chapter of Genesis, just like walking through a cemetery and reading what is engraved on the tombstone, can be even monotonous for some people. It's the same picture as the present hour in which we live. Things haven't changed much. Man still die. Now, we've extended a man's lifespan a few years, but I want to tell you, everybody's going to die. So you need to place your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In Genesis, we read of Enoch. In Genesis 5, 19 through 24, and Jared lived after he begat Enoch 800 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962, uh, 60 and two years, and he died. That means he collected a lot of Social Security checks. No, they didn't have the baby. And Enoch lived 60 and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Man, we're told that all of these begat sons and daughters, but we are not told anything about them. Just one particular son is lifted out, Enoch the son of Jared. We're told that Enoch lived 65 years, begat a son, the name Methuselah. Enoch had other children, but apparently his firstborn was Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah. If you're a father listening to me right now, maybe you'll understand. I don't know what, I, I do not know what he did before he begat Methuselah, but the Bible says that he walked with God after he begat Methuselah. And there's a part of me who wants to say, if you're a dad, and if you ever looked down on a newborn babe, and suddenly you thought, I better change. <laughs> I've got some responsibility now. It simply says that he walked with God after he began Methuselah. And I want to tell you, uh, 
uh, I'm glad he walked with God. It's such a great story for us. The presence of a child can really change. Even the preacher won't be able to say much that will affect you. But these little ones that God gives you, uh, they affect you. They come out of everywhere and they, and, and they seem so fresh and somehow or other they bring a message from God. Methuselah did this for Enoch. The record tells us that, Meth that after Methuselah, Enoch had other children, but it does not tell us that he died. And Enoch walked with God. And he was not, for God took him. One day, when talking about Enoch, this guy wrote me and said on, on Facebook, said, well, Enoch was perfect. Nah, Enoch wasn't perfect. Enoch was just a man. And you need to know that men in their own energy and their own strength, they're, they're not perfect. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, it says in Hebrews. But for before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Was it his works that pleased God? No. What was it? The Bible said it was his faith. If you're listening to me right now, I'm not done, but if you're listening to me right now, let me tell you, all your works are not what pleases God. It's your faith, your belief in him. And then the Bible says he, God took him. He didn't die, it was translated. It's the first rapture of man recorded in the Bible. There, 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 believe that, that there are people that believe you're going to go through the great tribulation people, and they use Noah, use Noah as an example. But Noah represents not the church, but those in the world who are going to be saved during the great tribulation. God's going to keep them. Who are they? Well, for one, there are 444,000 of Israel and then a great company of Gentiles. They're not part of the believers of the church that we're a part. We're told in the book of Revelation that before the winds of the great tribulation begin to blow across the earth and the four horsemen of the apocalypse begin to ride, 144,000 out of the nation of Israel will be sealed and also a great company of Gentiles. They're represented by Noah. God can keep you in the great tribulation, but it's not a question of whether or not God can keep you. The question is what God says. And he says you're going to be, that he's going to remove the believers. So we're not going to be here during the great tribulation. So you can, you can buy all the goods you want to prepare for the great tribulation and stack up your, your basement with water and goods. But I'm going to tell you something. If you believe Jesus, if you believe the word of God, then you're going to know that before the wrath of God, before the great tribulation, we're going to be pulled out of here because God has not appointed us to wrath. He cheered, told the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3.10, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I, will also, I, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon the, all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. What hour is going to be try the earth? The Great Tribulation. Enoch is the man who represents the church. Enoch didn't go through the flood. He got pulled out of here. He got pulled out of here. He was not in the ark. God didn't save him by putting him in the ark. God could have put him in the ark, but he didn't. He could have kept Enoch in safety during the flood, but instead he removed him. A great picture of the church. By faith, Enoch was translated. I love that. The best way I know can describe it is the way it was told by a little girl who came home from Sunday school and her mother asked, what did your children tell you about, uh, what did your teacher tell you about today? The little girl said she told us all about this man, Enoch. You can see that this was a good Bible teaching, Sunday school, and the mother said, well, what about Enoch? Well, Enoch lived a long time ago, the little girl said, and God would come by every afternoon and say to him, Enoch, would you like to take a walk with me? Would you like to take a walk with me? And Enoch would say, yes, I'd like to take a walk with you, God. And so every day God would come by Enoch's house and Enoch would go walking with God. One day God came by and said, Enoch, let's take a long walk today. I want to talk to you. So they started out. Enoch got his coat, he even took his lunch. They started walking. They walked and they walked and they walked and finally it got late. And Enoch said, my, it's getting late. 
and I'm a long way from home. Maybe we better start back. And God said, Enoch, you're closer to my home than you are to your own home. So you come on and go home with me. And so Enoch went home with God. I don't know how to tell that story any better than the teacher did to that little girl. The church, the body of true believers walking with God, like Enoch was, will one day go with him. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then the next verse, we know that Enoch pleased God by his faith. And it, so it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Now, I've thought about that little story ever since I read it. And I thought, man, that's true of all of us that walk with God. I even told my daughter, I say, uh, I think the next time I see somebody pass away, I'm going to tell the, uh, the relatives, well, you didn't need to understand that your dad or your mom walked with God. And all the years they walked with God and talked to God. But this time, God said, we are closer to my home than we are to yours. And they went home. I want to tell you this morning, everything we receive from God, everything we receive, we receive by faith. Salvation is not a reward. It's a gift. My relationship with God, it's a gift. I love him and he loves me. And that is a sustaining power in my life. Enoch walked with God and I walk with God. And if by faith you walk with God, there's coming a day we're going to be closer to that home than we are to this one. I want you to read uh, the words to an old song. It said, A penny for your thoughts, I said to the old man, as he sat there on the park bench all alone, with silver hair and wrinkled brow, eyes gleaming. He smiled and said, Oh, just thinking about my home. I sat down. We shared some laughs together. And the cinema of remembrance, it did seem, grown by. We talked about life's gains and its losses. But mostly, he just talked about his home. And there's a verse on there, and I'll just sing that little verse. It goes, he said, I'm thinking about home. Thinking about going home. Dreaming about leaving here. Ready to be moving on. It won't be long before the sun goes down. And I'll be gone. But until then, I'm thinking about home. And I said, tell me, old man, where's your home? And what's it like? He said, oh, ain't nothing around here that compares. You see, a king had it built. And gave the deed to me. And all my family's already there. If you're listening to this broadcast right now, I'd like you to bow your heads and pray with me. Say, thank you, Lord, that my experience with you is so rich because I have chosen to believe your word. To believe what you say. I don't let the circumstances rule me. I don't let what other people say rule me. 
but I live according to your word. And so it has established within me such a great faith. And you said without faith it's impossible to please you. But he that comes to you must believe that you are. And that you are a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. And right now today, by faith, we, we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We are led by your spirit. And every part of our lives we surrender to you, Lord. We'll quit fighting you. We'll keep, keep, uh, try to keep from negotiating with you, Lord, and saying, here's what I've done for you, because we've done nothing for you, and you've done everything for us. We love you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, there will come a time when we pulled out of this place and brought home to spend an eternity with you. We give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' name. I speak a blessing upon all the hearers of this message. May God continue to bless you, pour out His Spirit in such a mighty way. It affects everything you do, so when the rest of the world sees you, they'll say, surely these people have been with Jesus. Thank you so much for tuning into this today.